Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. The channel is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. Each week we interview an animal industry professional asking about the knowledge and skills needed to work with a particular animal. My next guest is Graham Besant. Graham is the owner, founder, bird handler and presenter at Gauntlet Birds of Prey, Eagle and Vulture Park at Nutsford in the UK. And he joins me now. Graham, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to it. Graham, please can you tell us first of all about this fantastic bird on your fist? Yeah, this is uh, an immature, um, in fact, a baby bald eagle. We bred him last year. He's a male. Um, and uh, it's off a, a pair that um, we've got in um, in a collaboration between ourselves and another zoo. Um, so we've bred bald eagles for many years, um, and this is just a pair we've got together um, with, like I say, this other zoo, and uh, they've been used for the last um, two years now. Um, this year they've got two babies with them. They they hatched back in March. Um, so, like I say, we've had three years, so incredible, really. Um, it's always lovely to, to have pairs that have been flying in the demonstrations and then those birds then go on to breed. Can you tell us, Graham, please, how easy or difficult is it to breed eagles in captivity? I mean, is it becoming routine like it is, for example, with falcons? Um, well, yes and no, really. Um, it, it, it just takes that pair bonding a little bit longer and I, and I, I'm a great sort of believer that um, when we when we use birds when they're young and we we put them into our demonstrations and such like they learn the life skills um, and then you almost can sort of learn from watching them you almost know the right time to then try them in a pair but then like with humans compatibility is a, a massive part of it so even though you just get a pair of bald eagles you get a male bald eagle and a female put them together it isn't just going to happen and um, with sometimes that it does but then just like with humans you know there can be a lot of trying and birds can try for two or three years and be unsuccessful and at that point you've then got to decide if that you know is there something missing in their their relationship really um and so then you have to maybe look at a another mate for them it isn't just that you put two birds together and it's all going to happen it just doesn't happen like that so with eagles with the maturity age being far greater than many of the other species and in particular falcons um you know a bald eagle will mature at about six years of age but they don't go fully mature you know and, and a bird that I, from my experience i always find that when they get to about nine or ten that's when they're really very ready for breeding and then as long as you give them the suitable mate the rest is is you know is history really what sort of behaviors are you looking for to identify compatibility or on the other hand incompatibility um, that's quite a hard question I, th it, I think really it's you work with birds i work with birds every day so you get to know what that bird's like and um, whether it's got a very easy going personality or you know it, they're very, some are very very confident some a little bit more held back and i think what it is is it's all about um for me it's all about looking for the bird itself and then trying to to pair it up with another bird so really ultimately you want the male to be the most confident and you want a bird that's very confident because he's the one that leads the breeding process he's the one that instigates it all a female could come into condition and if the male isn't isn't bringing her in that isn't going to all happen and that's a, that, you know that's a, something i've learned over the years definitely graham you are owner and founder of gauntlet birds of prey eagle and vulture park can you tell me could you describe please your career how did you come to be in this position <laughs> it's um it's, it goes back quite a way now really um i was I, I always had birds of prey when i was young when i was a kid i loved kestrels and sparrow walks and i flew that was a pastime it was a, a passion 
Um, and then I love travel. So when I got my first job, I um, used to save up all my money for my birds, but also to travel and go and see falconry as many places as I possibly could, as well as the UK. Um, and I was lucky enough when I was 21 to travel out to the United States, and I traveled right over and away to meet falconers out there uh, and watch them uh, with their birds. Um, I also went to a military place in America where they were using falcons for clearing runways and such like. So I went and saw as much falconry as I possibly could um, and also seeing birds in the wild. Um, and so my knowledge was growing and growing. And I was a, an engineer, like I, I was an apprentice engineer. I did, I served my apprenticeship and um, did my qualifications. And then in, when I was 26 years of age, I, I was at this point where um, I got made redundant and I thought, what do I do? Um, do I do something I want to do every day and wake up? And I was so, my birds were, were on my life um, and they were then. And they really took over a little bit over my job, really, if I'm truthful. Um, and so I, I, did, I made the decision that I'm going to, I want to wake up every morning and look forward to what I'm doing. Um, and I want to do something that I just, I'm so passionate about. And um, so I, I set a business up and set, set Gordon Bird of Prey Eagle and Vulture Park up in 1996. I made, made London in 95. I did a, 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 year, a college course, uh, owner business management, and then went into running my own business from 96 with 14 birds of prey um, and a pygmy goat and a pot belly pig. And it was a visitor center. So people had obviously come and see us. And I thought if we had the goats and uh, the pig, as long as the birds are prey for the shows and then ferrets, uh, then people would come. And that's basically what happened. You work with birds of prey, but you're the owner of the company. Do you see yourself as a businessman? As a bit. I think, I think one of the things my mother and father always used to say when I was a, a young lad, um, I could smell, I sell snow to Eskimos. I was always, um, in order to, 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 run, to run it, I always had loads of little businesses running when I was a school, school boy. Uh, I had my birds, but I all run. Um, I was always wheeling and dealing for one of a better word. Um, and so I ended up learning how money worked on a, on a low level, I'm not talking, you know, but uh, on a, and I knew that I could do something that could make money, but that wasn't the goal. The money was just to live and to pay for the birds, and, but I wanted to wake up just with my birds, really, and work and go for the sunset. So I realized I'd be out with the birds with the sunset, and I just finish with the birds and I go to bed, and that was literally what I wanted to do, um, and that's what I, I suppose I achieved. Fantastic. Uh, Graham, can you tell us, please, what skills, knowledge and personal qualities do you need to be successful in your position working with birds of prey in your own business? Um, I think you've got to treat every day as a school day. Every single day is a school day. I mean, I, I have lots. Of, I, we have in the summer, we have about nine members of staff here in the centre. And um, we obviously pull a lot of young who are fresh out of uni, such like off animal courses. Um, and I've learned that you can learn off them. Um, just because I've I've done this for a long time, um, I, I'm still, in my eyes, I still feel an amateur. Uh, and I know many, many old falconers um, that I still have utmost respect from because I learned from them, but I also learned from the young ones as well. And I think um, the skills you need are that you've got to to embrace other people doing it and watch what they do, to network with as many collections and visit as many collections as you possibly can. And that's not just in the UK, that's wherever I travel. I always like to go to a zoo and a collection and see their way of doing it. And um, I think you've got to be a definitely, a you've got to be dedicated. And uh, that's dedicated where you wake up in the morning and really you don't know when the day is going to end working with the animals because you, you can't, can't come in here and oh, you open up the door in the morning, but you can't close it at 4.30, 5 o'clock and walk away from it. It doesn't work like that. You've got to be prepared to live, breathe, sleep. And even, you know, you, you work, 
but in the summer we can work continual days you know you you're on you're on for, you, you know you don't get a day off for a month and you're exhausted with it you know you're tired because you feel tired but it's a nice tired because it's something you love and i think if you there's people that just love to absorb yourself and give everything you've got and working with animals is your career but if you're a person that wants to break away from it and have your your free time because you've, you've done your day's work you'll actually be in a conflict with it and it won't work for you and you'll be disappointed by it but also you won't achieve the goals you want to and that's where i am definitely that's why i believe and i think it's so important that people who come into it have got to realize it always wants that little bit more from you as a business person and the owner of gauntlet Birds of Prey, Eagle and Vulture Park in Nutsford. What would you say, Graham, are your three unique selling points as a business? Um, I think the selling points are that we'll go off and beyond. We'll give it more, as much as we've got. We won't give up until the job's done. Um, I think you've got to be imaginative and you've got to look at what other collections other zoos are doing around the world and and pick what what fits for you and to make yourself different and, and that's really and i think like i go back to the point about young people they can teach you know coming in and they might have never done this job but they can they can teach you lots and you can you can get new ideas and it's about being innovative you've got to You've got to be constantly changing. Um, I'm not saying I, I love watching anybody's shows and I love the simplest of shows where somebody's got that real affinity with that bird. Um, but then I also like the show where you do that a little bit more and fly many different species. I love flying loads of different species, but, um, but right, finding the right combination. And I think finding the right combination and flying those birds to their to their abilities not trying to get a bird to do what it can't do and i think some people try and do that um, and i think we pride ourselves in that we we understand our birds and we understand who's good at x or you know x or y and um, not trying to make one bird do what it's just not capable of. that's what for us is made us well given us success definitely definitely um, so yeah, it, it's simple. It's uh, it's simple, and there's been no magic ones that have made it happen. It's just understanding the birds. Thank you, Graham. Um, do you take on volunteers, Graham? And what do you look for in a volunteer? We do take on volunteers. Um, we we we're, at the moment after COVID, we've got a hardcore of volunteers that come in. Um, week in week out and uh, I've got a couple of retired guys who've been with me now for 11 years and they come every Tuesday and they're my handymen but they love being around the birds and you know involved a little bit um, and then we have many others that have just carried on coming for years and years which is lovely um, and they really assist the staff but we, we just look for somebody who's dedicated and and you know is, has got the interest of the birds and, um, and, and will come along and want to learn and uh, and listen really, um, but also feedback what they think. Um, and that's what we look for, someone confident um, and uh, who, who just buzzes off it. You know, when, when somebody comes into an animal job, if you're an animal person, you, you know body language better than anybody really, um, because you've got to read bo animal body language and animals read your body language constantly. That's what gives you an easy ride or a hard ride. If they read your body language and know you, they, they, that trust kicks in. Uh, and so when we have volunteers, we instantly know when they are working with the birds with us under our guidance. We know where the ones who are cut out and the ones who are not. Interesting, very interesting. Um, was it uh, easy or difficult to find a suitable avian veterinarian for the park? Um, yeah, I mean, I, when I was a young man, I, I remember I had a, a veterinary guy who's since passed away he was a lovely guy a guy called Roy White and I had all the time in the world for him but he had all the time in the world for me and um, and when 
he stopped practicing. I still carried on with him for a number of years, going to his house and he had a small clean his house and he just used to help me out. It was lovely. And then when he went, I had to then look around and then I went from one to another, but I've got a, a, an avian veterinary now who, who's an incredible guy. I get along very well with him. Um, a guy called Aidan Rafferty. And uh, he, he's just one of those guys who's, is good. Um, he's fanatical on his work and he networks with all the other avian vets. So he's, I remember once going there with, with a, a problem and uh, he said, oh, Graham, I, have, I haven't got a clue. He said, I think, he said, I've never seen this before in a bird. Um, I remember he said, right, we'll go on to my, my group chat uh, with all these vets. And there were vets from America vets from all over and he, he sent me put pictures and video of the bird he was diagnosing and all the theories were coming back um so i found one who's very very good and i certainly don't want to let him go he's that good um graham how would you describe the bird of prey center industry today that's a really hard question i i think i think the bird of prey industry in the uk has grown and grown um i think that um the bird of prey centers that are are, are coming out and, and shining out are the ones who are really actively involved in conservation um and i think the criteria for a bird of prey center is very different to when i set up in 1996 and i think you've got to evolve and I think you've got to have goals. And um, so I, I think there's many, there's lots and lots of good and big centers out there. But I think what really sets those centers is not for me to say that's, a, you know, centers are good, but I think they're all great. If somebody's dedicated and puts the effort in, that, that for me says about the bird of prey center. But I think our job is to educate people but also the birds are there as ambassadors for in the wild and they've got to be represent in a conservation world those to the birds and the, that we've got but wildlife in general and a sense has got to and i think that's how people should grade them you know in their own minds if those people are really actively involved in conservation then that is so important because it isn't just about flying birds for our pleasure and human pleasure it's not about that. It, it's about it's about helping the species in the wild and we're raising awareness and, and educating people about conservation, but also about those animals. And so I like to just, I like to be very involved in conservation and the species we're using are, are representing those ones in the wild. Um, but also when the birds are being used, so the vet, and, like I mentioned my vet, you know, I remember, you know, if we have any subjects that die, I love it when that subject can, can go on to a veterinary, some sort of veterinary to, to have some research done on it and the tissue samples and such like that and take, you know, take the information from it. What bird of prey centers to do isn't just about flying birds, it's so much more. What particular endangered species have you had the, the greatest conservation breeding successes with, Graham? Well, over the years, we've, we've bred many birds, um, many different species. Um, we're really lucky that we've, we've, we produce African whiteback vultures, which is something that are very dear to my heart. For the last 15 years, in the wintertime, I go out to Africa and work on a project out there um, with RWT. We, we work very closely with some incredible scientists and BirdLife South Africa and such like. I know that some of the guys from there, and, and we're lucky that I go out to Africa and, and work with young birds, monitoring them, putting ring tag, ring, rings on them and wing tags on them. And, and we've even satellite tracked the birds. Uh, I was buzzing actually from Thursday because one of the partners we work out in, in South Africa with um, two years ago, um, we, it, it, there was a rehab Cape vulture, which we were able when we arrived in South Africa, um, we were said that this rehab vulture was ready for, and we were going to put satellite backpack 
and um, and on the other i get regular updates but on thursday i got a map of africa and all the movements since 2017 and it, of this particular cape vulture and it was absolutely made me buzz it was like yeah that bird i've actually touched and 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 really you know released and it you know it's it's doing well for itself in the wild and um, but the white backs are just so incredible and we've got a pair here at gauntlet and we've got a young male bird that's in our shows at the moment um that will be being paired up and we're, we're part of the stud book for those birds and um, so their young will be put into conservation which is just incredible um and we've done other birds and uh, hooded vultures we've got breeding which is in another in critically endangered animal um and so our, you know we're really involved in that we want to join the stud book with that bird as well fantastic graham how would you describe the bird of prey center sector going forward 20 years oh, i'd like to think that we're we're still educating people and young people and setting up passions and and you know recruiting for and inspiring to think about the next 20 years and the following 20 years that's what we've got to do um, and centers have got to do that in school and saying about our environment and how how little changes we can do for ourselves are so important because we make little changes and then they ultimately they make massive changes but I want centres using those birds that they've got in the shows and supporting birds in the wild. And that's what I want. But ultimately, in 20 years, hopefully things will start to change and we'll see success of birds that are, are endangered now. Maybe with the support and help, they're then at healthy numbers in the wild. And I'd love to think that would be happening. Graham, as um, a person who works with birds of prey professionally, what advice have you got for anybody who wants to work with birds of prey? All I can say is read as much as you can um, and learn about your subjects and your subject matter. Uh, visit as many zoos and clay and, and and look at how they keep the birds, how they present the birds, how they talk about the birds and, and use all that and, and learn from every, every place you go to. And then if, it, if it, like as if you've got that passion and that spark that you really, that's what you want to do with your life, just go for it, go for it. Because, you know, and, and don't be put off what people say the, about the animal industry. Sometimes the animal industry is up to, you know, for being low paid and stuff and all sorts of factors like that and long hours. But you know what? It's really worth it. It's just, it, it's lovely to wake up, you know, and, and do something you want to do. And not, really, you don't wish your life away. Like, What's your most treasured possession in your hawking bag? Oh, what's my most treasured? Oh, I, I suppose what's my most treasured possession? Oh, you know what? I've got um, I've got boxes at, at home of bits of kit I've I've collected over the years, but I've got some really special hoods to make incredible special hoods that when I touch are still get that buzz from the first day I put it on and it fitted the bird, bird perfectly. Um, so yeah, I would have to say a hood without a doubt. What are the three most influential books that you've read? Falconry and Hawking by Philip Glacier. Um, Falconry in the Muse by Emma Ford. Um, but Jack, Jack, Jack Mabogato, I've got to say, A Hawk for the Bush. Um, the Falcon, and then I, I love the book by Philip Glacier, of The Falconer Bells. Oh, I, I love one that's over the year really cynically looked at, of, um, owned by an eagle, of, um, Gerald Summers. I've got to say, I've got, I could go on forever. I've got a book collection that I'm so proud of, and each book is special to me. But I've got to say, you know, the, the, when I get off this interview with you, um, hundreds of other titles have just been going through my head all night that I've got that when I touch the special. Um, but I've got to say, Falkery and Hawking by Philip Glacier, I often refer to that as the bird Bible. It, it, I think it's such a well-written book. Um, and a book when I was a kid, I used to cherish every page I turned over because it, it, it just taught me about my art 
Um, but um, like I say, so many other authors that are just absolute. I mean, there's H for Hawk, which is a, a more modern, uh, all about Gosshawk, and that that got a lot of um, reviews done on it. An incredible book. Um, but I do love the old books. The old books are, you know, where Falkery was, you know, birds were taken on passage and haggard birds, and I love things like that. That's my art. That's my passion, and I adore going on those and reading those books, definitely. Graham, have you anything else that you'd like to add? No, you know, I, I, I always said that, you know, one thing I've always been known for, and that's just follow your dreams. And, and I definitely started following my dreams 25 years ago. And believe me, I never looked back. I've never looked back once, ever. I've only ever looked forward. Um, and every day is a school day. And every day, it, it, it sounds like people say we can't. Yeah, it, falconry the, that we're in the animal industry. The one thing I haven't said is it's full of the greatest highs and the worst lows. And I can't. That is it. If you can take your highs and your lows, then you, you're all right. It's very rarely in that middle ground there. It's high or low, and um, because it's just nature and it, it's animals and, and we're nature, you know. And so. Um, that's the only thing I would say. It's the greatest highs. Don't think it's just a holiday and every day is going to be wonderful. Far from it. Far from it. Um, but I always, my mother, my late mother always used to say to me, just remember, son, she said, you can't. And when I went into this, I suddenly learned that the only thing I was ever told. That's absolutely brilliant. Graham Besant, owner and founder at Gauntlet Birds of Prey Centre, Vulture Park at Nutsford in the UK. Thank you very much for being on The Practical Animal. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. An honour.